On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumna, Dr. Carol Stevenson, to address convocation. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly is a, an honor to be here today. Uh, thank you, President Shakma, uh, and thank you for your very kind words. Uh, Chancellor Cowan, Dean Kennedy, faculty, staff, graduating class of 2016, distinguished guests, my warmest congratulations first and foremost to Western's outstanding new alumni of 2016. There are a few moments in life as sweet as the day of your graduation at university. And like any great achievement, you appreciate it best when you share it with someone who loves you, particularly someone who has been with you and for you throughout the triumphs and the setbacks of the years leading to its attainment. Well, this morning you are surrounded by the right energy. Alumni Hall hums with the energy of love, hope, pride, optimism, and excitement. All of it is for you, our graduates. All of it is well deserved. I am very honored to share this day with you and with your families and friends. In my 10 years as Dean of the Ivy Business School, I witnessed almost 8,000 students receive their degrees here in London and in Hong Kong. It never got boring. The truth is, it was one of my most favorite activities of being Dean. I found it gratifying to share in the sense of accomplishment and pride of many of the students that I'd come to know during their time at Ivy. In fact, I love to chat with our graduates as they knelt to be hooded, as you soon will be. I was so excited for them and relished that final private moment of shared pride, for I had no idea when or if I would see them again. But inevitably, during my first few convocations, a moment would come when I would sense something was amiss. I would glance up to find a flustered convocation director scowling at me. A quiet but stern reprimand would follow. Once again, the enthusiastic participation of a novice dean had resulted in an, an unsightly bottleneck on stage that was slowing down convocation. So you can count yourself lucky for my early lessons on the protocols of the timeliness and the time-sensitive ceremony. I will not risk the wrath of the convocation director this morning by talking too long. In reflecting on my marks for today, though, I came across a quote about my own career from one of my mentors, Doreen Mackenzie Saunders. She wrote in a memoir that she published last year at the ripe young age of 94, and I quote Doreen. She said, Carol's courage is to be admired. It stopped me. And to understand why, you need to know a little bit about Doreen. She was originally hired as the assistant editor of the Ivy Business Journal back in 1963, when it was called the Business Quarterly. She was barely five feet tall. She was a gale force wind of change throughout her 25 years at the business school. A woman who wielded significant influence in a very male-dominated organization. When Doreen was hired, it was suggested that they publish her name on the magazine's masthead with the initial D instead of Doreen. As she noted in her memoir, it was reasoned that if it were known that I was a woman and that I was editing the journal, it would lose credibility. However, the magazine was about to lose me if the initial was insist insisted upon. Doreen, I remained but not without a battle, one of the many battles to come. Such were the prejudices of the time." End of quote from Doreen. Now, fortunately, times have changed. But during this period, there were no female faculty members at Western's Business School, and there were no women in the undergraduate HBA program. And there wouldn't be for another 10 years. Astonishing, isn't it? Well, Doreen was truly out there, on her own, a courageous woman of her time. So you can understand why it came as a surprise to me 
that she thought that my career had been defined by courage. I had never considered myself courageous, so I began to give courage a lot of thought. Ernest Hemingway once said, courage is grace under pressure. I believe this. And I know that you've been in that place too. Perhaps it was that terrible, awful day when everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Perhaps your day began with a schedule that was already packed, but you needed to fill it in a little bit more because you had to study and prep for a difficult finance exam and a job interview, both happening the next day. You were worried, sleep deprived, and to make matters worse, had slept in. You forged a plan. But as you were pulling out your laptop for your first class, you realized that you had a text. And it was from a member of your case team who was sick. And now it was up to you to prep and present her part of the case as well. Then your prof cold called you to begin the discussion. You froze, she frowned, and moved on. Now, in your mind, you might at this point have wanted to crawl under the desk and stay there forever. Or clearly envisioned yourself running at warp speed to the exit sign, done, on to a new career. Instead, as you are here today, you likely paused and took stock after class let out a groan. Perhaps you called a fellow student for some encouragement. You adjusted your perspective and expectations for the next 24 hours. And then hopefully you did call your sick friend to see if she needed anything. In situations like these, sometimes all there is to do is put one foot in front of the other. I call these the groan and get over moments. It takes courage to keep going when the cards feel stacked against you. Expect plenty of these moments. Expect the problems will get more complex and more will be at stake. I don't know any successful leader, including myself, who hasn't had a handful of these character testing days, weeks, even months, and possibly years. They're horrible and they're awful and they are golden. They help us learn who we are, who we want to be, and what is most important to us. They call on us to be courageous, and they define and strengthen our character. And courage in all its manifestations is at the heart of a life well lived, a life that makes a difference. And isn't that what we all want? We don't usually think of courage when we think of how we conduct ourselves daily. Courage brings to mind veterans who have risked their lives in wars, friends who have battled terminal illnesses with optimism, paraplegics who have won gold medals, or refugees who leave their homes and start from scratch in a new country. Indeed, these individuals are great role models for us, but courage is something that we all can and do practice in our everyday lives. Courage can show up as persistence and resilience in the face of adversity. Courage is about not giving up on your dreams. Or, and this is very important to me, courage can show up as kindness and compassion. Courage is reaching out when it would be easier to turn away and not get involved. Winston Churchill said, Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. And courage is a muscle that's strengthened by practicing it both in our professional and our personal lives through our everyday actions, decisions, and choices. It's not a character trait that we can hope will appear magically at the moment when we need it. We must exercise it in a multitude of ways on a regular basis just as we would prepare for many months or years to run a single race. So, I reflected on my career from the perspective of courage and tried to see what Doreen saw. And I realized that knowing myself, being true to myself, and acting on my beliefs had been at the core of my career that had been exceptionally rewarding, always interesting, 
and far different than I could have imagined at the age of 22 when I graduated and began working for Bell Canada. I realized that being true to myself required many acts of courage, both small and large. But as an achiever like you, I was focused on attaining my goals, and it's only in hindsight that I see the powerful and positive effect many small acts of courage had on my life. Most importantly, courage has enabled me to influence areas beyond the scope of my professional roles, particularly in championing women's issues, but also in tackling important roles in the not-for-profit sector and leading government task forces that have had direct impact on the social and economic well-being of our country. Here is the nub. Courage is simple. It's just not easy. So, Convocation Director, I'll cut to the chase. Here are 10 principles that have been my guides for a very courage, courageous career and life. First, do the things you fear. I had always hated public speaking. I really was quite shy when I was growing up, but early on in my career, I was encouraged by a mentor to take on various spokesperson's roles. As much as I hated it in the beginning, it opened up an entirely new realm of possibility for me. I gained credibility in my business career as I advocated for the transformation of the telecommunications industry. And I honed the art of persuasion that would later enable me to negotiate agreements, partnerships, and opportunities for both the company and the employees that I led. Second, when you make a mistake, face it, admit it, apologize, learn, and then move on. People are quick to forgive mistakes as they, as they are to distrust people who won't admit to them. A moment of courage can lead to a lifetime of trust, which we all know is very important in business. Third, try new roles and assignments that make you uncomfortable. Step out of your comfort zone. Turn fear of failure on its head. At least three times in my career, I've taken on roles that friends have said, that's a career ender, don't do it. When I was asked to take on a non-traditional role for women in telecommunications by running a plant, my friends advised against it. But I thought, why not? The worst that could happen is that I could be fired. In reality, it was a turning point in my career, and I went on to take other non-traditional roles. Joining Ivy is another example. At that point in my career, most of my colleagues, friends, and family cautioned me against branching into this unknown territory. But my thought was this, what better time to do this than when I'm at the peak of my career, where my skills, knowledge, and experience can really make a difference? What a wonderful opportunity to continue influencing and encouraging young people like you who want careers in business. I had hired lots of them. So what a tremendous life-enriching experience I would have missed if I had been less courageous. Fourth, don't let competition and ambition get in the way of helping others or doing the right thing. The best way to build a network that will fortify your career is to seek ways to help peers within your company, your industry, or in community groups such as your alumni association. Begin each relationship with the question, how can I help you? Success is not the result of stepping over others. It is a consequence of stepping up for others. Fifth, know your limits, but don't let them limit you. Surround yourself with good people who complement your skills. To achieve this means that you need to be self-aware. You need to know your strengths, and you need to know your weaknesses. And I learned from some great leaders that self-knowledge is invaluable. Embrace people smarter than you are. They are not a threat. But looking at yourself honestly takes courage. Six, give credit to others. Do not hoard recognition to yourself. Amplify the voices of those who don't have the same opportunity to be heard. Do this in all areas of your life and do it frequently. Seventh, 
be compassionate, and be kind. One of the hardest things to do is to stand up for family members or colleagues who have made mistakes. When everyone around you is condemning someone, it takes real courage to be the voice of reason and to stand against the tide of public opinion. You yourself may be criticized publicly for it. We all make mistakes in our lives. Be willing to forgive. Eighth, be honest and act with integrity. In other words, keep your moral compass in good working order. And have the courage to trust this instrument to guide you when the road gets dark. Ninth, get involved in your community. I cannot stress this enough. I've dedicated almost as many hours contributing to the community as I have given to my professional career. Whether it was chairing the United Way Fund here in London, offering my time and expertise to federal and provincial task forces on important policy issues, or taking a stand on removing barriers for women in executive positions or in the boardroom. It will never feel like you have enough time to do these things, but you will gain so much more from it than the time it requires of you. Courage is about going above and beyond. And last, be grateful and let others know. You live in one of the best countries in the world by any measure. And no matter how hard you personally worked to get into this program or to reach this day, you have received one of the most extraordinary educational experiences this country has to offer. Remember to say thank you today and throughout your life. Say it often and with purpose and sincerity, whether it's to the caretaker who cleaned your office, your friend, your parents, or the president of the company, or the university. Thank you, President Shakma and Western University for this great honor today. This afternoon, many of you will sign a pledge to your fellow alumni to endeavor to act with moral clarity, grace, and nobility and above all, aspire to make a contribution to your society. Rest assured, the Ivy alumni who crafted this pledge knew from experience that success is not a solo venture, and your courage will be tested at the most unexpected times. The world needs your dreams. Hold on to them and use your extraordinary talents to make a difference in the world. Live your lives with courage. It's been a tremendous honor sharing this momentous occasion with you. I wish each and every one of you the very best of success and happiness ahead. Thank you.